because it wouldn't be something that would attract what I found in Lancaster. Well, the reason I settled here, the reason I bring my grandson. Okay, the flavor of where Rogaritos is and all of that brick. If there was some way to fix that facade, <coughs> rather than bring that in and destroy the flavor. The other thing I was going to say is that's awful for Charlie. It's Prince Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, my name is Kevin Lynn. I live on Chestnut Street. In fact, if I walk out my back door, I can see the back of Anytime Fitness and Rob, back of Rob and the buildings there. And uh, I live in adaptive reuse. I'm proud to say that where I live has a walkability score of 99 out of 100. And I look at a building like this and I say to myself, this would look great in Phoenix. <laughs> and I lived in Phoenix. I live here in Lancaster. I came home to Pennsylvania three years ago after being gone since 1980. I do not want this in my neighborhood. Let's be very clear about this. There's a, not just a walkability, but there's a human scale to the city that has, that draws people to it, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We have a treasure here, and it is this city, it is this atmosphere, it is this environment, and we have to fight like hell to keep it. I'm sorry we have to do that. And I realize the economic pressure to build up and make this thing economically viable, but sir, I don't want this in my, literally, in my backyard. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Sherry Seuss. This is my husband, Scott, and we live on Queen Street. And this is right in the middle of our sunshine and our sunset. And it's huge. It's going to take away our view. And I mean, I understand, too. I, I'm really conflicted because we have a business, and it will help, maybe. But it's also going to how do we destroy our view? So. A view of uh, historic churches and streetscape and, and whatnot that we can see. And one of the reasons we bought our building was because of the view out, out there of, of being able to see the historic nature of the town. And you're just totally going to obliterate what we can appreciate from our from our building that we invested in. Because we won't be able to see past it. You know, so we've got a whole chunk of being able to see church people neighborhoods and everything else, so I can look at the back of that. That's not what I came for. Uh, yes, in the back. Good evening, my name is Andy Burfond, and I'm a relatively new resident here in the city of Lancaster, having transplanted here from another state to retire. I love this city, and I'm listening to my fellow Lancastrians say how much they love the city also. I'm here today wearing three hats of concern. The first one is because as a retired senior in the city, hearing that this project is supposedly going to be geared up to 55 and over and perhaps assisted living and perhaps also um, uh, more intensive care uh, piques my interest in having uh, a, a development company have their sights set on a piece of property, whether or not it's the right piece of property, and uh, want to do something like this. So I wear that hat. The second hat I wear is because I live in a historic building in the city, and I'm also, I serve on the board of that building. That is the Clock House Condominium Association, formerly the Hamilton Watch Company. Most of us know the significance that Hamilton Watch has in the city of Lancaster. And we are proud to say that as far as adaptive reuse, we were one of the pioneers in the city. I'm sure many of you would agree to take an old building and redo it to what it is today. We struggle to live up to the signs on each end of our property that says luxury condominium residences, that's a lot of work, okay? The third hat that I come here today wearing is something that is really personal to me and I even have some support sitting on each side of me because um, we are 
three vendors in hidden treasures. Now it's very, very interesting that all of the conversation that's taking place about this potential development never names hidden treasures by name. By the way, we live up to our name. We tell everybody down the aisle, down the alleyway behind Robertos is how we always direct people. Okay, and um, you know we kind of feel left out in the cold. We were advised at the end of 2018 that, guess what, folks? We're not quite sure how long this is going to take, but you guys are going to have to find somebody else to sell your wares. So that's my third hat. So if I tie all of this together, personally, uh, this is a great idea. I only wonder whether or not there's the possibility with the uh, the economics end of it that the gentleman pointed out that maybe there's still another way to pare it down to make everybody happy. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Gary Jones. I have 40 years of living in Lancaster and um, have seen a lot of changes in the city uh, due to the historic nature of the buildings. Um, the city's new, I guess it's still a new tagline, is the city authentic? And it's really hard to maintain being city authentic if the authentic things are pulled down and then inauthentic things are put into place. People are drawn to the city by the authenticity. It's not a surprise that the, the retail anchor of the city of Lancaster was the 300 block of Queen Street where all the buildings looked like they used to. All of the urban renewal that happened in around Lancaster Square, we're still recovering from that. That Hess building that was Bulova <laughs> is finally being done. Um, if anyone remembers that Eastern European art architecture that used to comprise Lancaster Square, um, <laughs> we're, we're, we, I think it's a bad idea to rush into, into quick changes in, in, in our block in our cityscape structure um, without thinking about the 50-year the, the horizon, the 100-year horizon. And this building, to me, recalls the towers to the north, which are not something we really celebrate architecturally, those buildings to the north. I, I and, uh, grew off, put some money into it, and, did, and tried to make it look better. But it's still, but we all know what it looks like. Um, that, you said Phoenix, I, I was thinking for like the, the Baltimore Harbor. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know, but, but there's, what we need to maintain, the, what we, we can't destroy what we, the, 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 the thing that we're trying to get people to enjoy. That was something. All right, there may be one more comment. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm next to Barry Hiller. Um, the one thing that shocks me the most about this is that it's pretty much the like textbook definition of gentrification, um, where a real estate agent comes in, buys a property that they know is going to uh, need to be remodeled, or in this case, demolition, um, and then comes to us and says, hey, we're going to build this really big, fancy apartment, uh, or well, senior living uh, facility. Um, so that's a really big concern and really big red flag. And I think, you know, as a historical commission, you know, um, it's important to not just look at, you know, the far past, but the historical present and kind of see the transition that the city's going through. Um, and that this is a part of a larger uh, uh, change that's happening in the city that isn't actually benefiting the, uh, you know, the residents of it. I know uh, last year you were investing like $6 million in uh, millennial, or housing targeting millennials. Now you're targeting uh, seniors, uh, so I guess you're going to have to pay the rent that you needed to have to pay, um, and so you're looking forward to folks who have more steady income. Um, so these are all really big red flags that make me extremely concerned about how this property is going to be used and uh, future properties down the line uh, next time you come here asking for uh, making a major change in the city. <laughs> I think we should move to, yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll talk on. about the building condition. The demolition by the black. Well, we can. Do you have another hand? Okay. 
Oh, God. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Gene Leite. And as you probably know, I'm an architect. Also, <clears throat> I'm a certified professional planner for development and so on. Uh, I've lived in this community about 40 years. Uh, we hardly talked at all tonight about this question of demolition of existing historic intruding structure in the National Register of History. And I understand it's, there's plenty to talk about when something like this is up on the screen. Uh, but I think this is the most unfortunate proposal because really there is room in this city for new construction and for good new contemporary design. Uh, there are parcels which are available. They may not be as cheap as a parcel that has a falling down building on it. It may not be owned by this developer, but there are parcels all around the city where something of this scale and newness could be done, but it would have to be designed far better than this, I must say. Whoever would be chosen to design it. This does not, this appearance of this structure does not bring any of them going anywhere. Point to the Ruoff Tower or to the HNC Tower as an example. It's, uh, that's a non-starter, I would say, for most people. Now, if I could, I want to speak about the existing buildings. Because I've got your first chart. The Historical Commission is really here to talk about what are we doing with these contributing historic buildings. Uh, there are nearly 14,000 of them that are on the National Register because, not because each one of them is the Fulton Opera House or the Central Market or the place where James Buchanan lived, but because many of them are kind of average architecture, background buildings, but they're intact and they're coherent. They're an assembly of nearly 14,000 buildings, which themselves individually may not seem particularly significant, but as a collective group, they form the largest, or one of the largest, recognized National Register of Districts in America. I don't know if a lot of people actually realize that. I don't think it's said well. <coughs> the reason is because there's a coherent a consistency, a continuity, and they're not memorials, they're not monuments to our past. They are active, living, uh, usable, reusable structures, which in that pattern has been our cultural pattern for two or three centuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what? So if you can succinctly get to your your point for the existing. Someone who buys a building in this condition, to me, it's hard to believe that you would not recognize it's going to be a very expensive proposition. I'm not going to re-argue that debate and question to Mr. Foster, but it's been my experience that others in the past come before this work with existing buildings and have said, oh, it's going to cost two or three million dollars. And I've, after that, looked into it with quite some detail with structural engineers and contractors. And I've demonstrated my satisfaction that the work has been done at one quarter of that cost. Now, I usually hardly spend any time on this discussion about over six million dollars. It sounded to me like that was being suggested as the cost of stabilizing or carrying the building. Is that correct? Do I understand that right? No, that's not correct. It's not to stabilize. If I were to basically just put in a little bit of work to keep everything intact, that is a different price point than if we need to basically remove structural elements, re-fortify, re uh, take down part of the brick wall and rebuild it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of considerations like that. I mean, well, that's, that's not that's not money of water here. We're talking about what it would take just to keep this building standing, let it continue to act as it does now in terms of occupancy or something similar. So sure. not turn it into a hospital facility. Let's not price it, you know, so that we can uh, put a high-rise piece of construction on top of it. Price to 
repair a building like this is supposed to be realistically presented to the commission. And the commission, by the way, with all due respect, the commission is supposed to ask for that evidence as evidence, as proof that there is some compelling reason that a building must come down. I wasn't able to tell the last one, but I... Yeah, we, I mean, this report has, I know nobody, Everybody doesn't have this report, but gives descriptions and costs, cost per square foot, what it entails. I, I appreciate knowing that. Well, there's a, well, there, the 6.5 with a description about it and a 3.67 with a description about it uh, on work that would need to be done. So there's a suggestion that there's over three million dollars to stabilize this building to make it useful again. Is that correct? The question that you're asking is whether or not, uh, no, it's not $3 million to keep it intact exactly like it is. That's not that's not the, the price point that we're talking about. Has anybody about. figured that out? Um, I don't have an actual price point to, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's. Even though, yes. I mean, that is the charge. Can we, I actually uh, did the analysis of the building. I utilized the two structural engineering reports that we had. One was from a, Historic preservation structural engineer <coughs> from Light Heigl, uh, who was represented here. Um, the, the two price points that we had one at six and a half million dollars was to restore the full building that we have, bring it up to code, bring it up to today's standards, and make it a fully functioning, usable building to today's standards. And what sort of use? The same use of the tent. The other number that we have is to utilize a front portion of the building, shell it out and make it so that it can be built on top of it. Uh, top of it. Top of it. That's the three million dollars. That's the less expensive. The more sure. expensive is to bring it back to today's standard. All right, thank you. Okay. So I don't want to make this yeah. too long, John, I think we're all going to move on. Yeah, we're going to move on at this point. So, yeah. I think we, it yeah. should be part of the record that thus far, the applicant really has not described or figured out what it would cost to stabilize and fix this building if it were to remain as it is. And I also want to note that I'm aware uh, that in 2015, this building uh, had structural work done to it. There was a period of condemnation. And uh, there was some question about how that work was uh, executed. And uh, I have observed in the past month waterfalls of snow melt and rain pouring over that front facade. So it's hard for me to understand how this can be considered an emergency, and yet we're continuing six months now since September when you purchased it, is that right? Uh, continuing, people are still in the building, the snow shoring, the truck hasn't been ported off. And I do agree that the building is in serious condition, but I don't agree that it deserves to be demolished because it is very significant. Yeah, thank you. We're going to actually we're going to we're going to we're, we're going to close the comments because we need to move on and to and take take a vote at this point in time. Thank you. Before you vote, there's something important that has to be addressed here, brother. And that is last year. What you're not recognized at this point, sir. We're moving ahead. Last year, when we went before the city council after a vote to agree to demolition by this commission, we were told that the historical commission should have asked more questions and should have gotten a second opinion on construction and didn't do it. The city council was not in a position to do it. So, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a lot more questions that should be asked here before this motion. That, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Okay, do I hear do I hear a motion on this? I, 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 I move that we uh, move demolition to just, by neglect. Excuse me. I move that we vote to disapprove all of the demolition and well, yeah, I need separate motions. Well, all right. I Can you combine one. the demolition? Well, no. it's, even the demolition should well, be two. I move to disapprove the demolition for number one on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Robert Rito. Robert Rito. Okay. Right. You know, I hear a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I hear a motion on 2.2. .2. I move to be disapproved 2.2. 2. 
because it does not meet the design standards. No, we're, on, we're still on demolition of that part TV. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't the Ooh. rear. Yeah. I don't have any sense on it, whatever you want. Oh. Another de demolition. Yeah. The other demolition, which is 2.2. Right here. Yeah. Okay. But you were starting to say design standards. <clears throat> I move we disapprove demolition 2.2. So here, may, may I may I amend that? Just, just yeah. I, I just want to. Well, we one... need a second and then amend. Okay. Okay, I'll second it, and then I'd like to amend the language right. of the motion. Um, I want it to be clear that we are a recommending body that we do not make we do not approve or disapprove any applications. Um, that is the purview of City Council. So I, I would change the language to say, I, rec I move that this board recommend denial of the application for demolition of the rear portion of 221 North Prince Street to allow new construction of the site. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do I hear a motion of 2.3 on the new construction? Do we need a motion? I don't know. Do we need a motion? Okay. I'll, I'll, Do I hear a motion? Okay, I move that we uh, recommend that City Council deny the application uh, for construction of a new 13-story mixed-use building per the small architecture plans and material specifications. And this uh, recommendation for denial is uh, references Secretary of Interior Standards 1, 2, 5, and 6. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. This is the bill in front of. Um, it goes to the city council. It's going to go to the committee meeting first, uh, on April 1st. Um, and I will let you know that it might go on to council April 9th, but it's and it's what's decided in the committee. Okay. Thank you. We'll give a minute or two here to switch. Thank you. Applicants. Um, Taking item three and four on the agenda at the same time. Okay. 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 There are arguments in this we don't have to be able to realize that we have a That's a Tuesday. How much due diligence should we do before buying the property? I'm totally out of order. One thing that could be done is how much the first the first time the building. I would not talk about the criteria that has to be met in order for somebody to ask to have the building on. We already bought it. Nobody here can talk about that. And that is the process. You're supposed to let all these people know what it takes to get a law change that you can demolish historic buildings. You know you, you know you have that information and you should have shared it with the public. You know what it takes to have a historic building demolished. And that's what this discussion should have been about tonight. I understand how you all feel, but you didn't do anything to educate the public here and telling them the criteria that has to be met by a developer to ask, to have the nerve, to have the chutzpah, to come here and ask for a historic national Man. registered building Man. that's associated with two other warehouses to be demolished. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had to say it. Okay, we're moving on to item three and four on the agenda. When uh, you can set up, and then we'll talk. Yeah, that's what I mean, he can set up. Uh, she 
The fire stations are taken, are they taken as separate items? Um, my review is together, but they're going to have to vote separately. Everyone leave. Well, did you read your review? What was required to demolish? I thought so. I thought I always believed it. Yeah, I think you yeah. did. What did the reason? You read the review as to what was required. Yeah. It was all in there. One, two, three, four. Uh, 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 I <laughs> uh, in the paper market. Uh, actually, no. Uh, it'll be online. And, and the contribution of these on the We have early print deadlines. I wish. <laughs> uh, probably as exciting as a historical commission. Yeah, I'm one through well, well, they're duplicates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't see the one from the Oh, they're not. One of the sets is missing a drawing. That one, the exciting one. Oh, that's not bad. It's not really made. I'm going back and forth. 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 i am going back Last yeah, no, we will be yeah, absolutely will be. It's mm -hmm. um, yeah. on the agenda. Well, but you need to um, find out your status. So. Yeah, it should. It will be on the building. April agenda that we discuss <laughs> uh, changes to be made to both the process and the We found this. I think we wanted to meet the former to discuss. So, Suzanne, do you want to read your um, review of? I guess you can read them both. Yeah. No, um, these opposed. These are actually two different. Um, applications in two different sites, um, both involving demolition of existing fire stations and construction of new fire stations in East King and West King. Bruce is going to present differently and you're going to vote on them separately, but I do with my reviews just matter. Uh, my review on the demolition request is appropriate with conditions. Demolition of relatively modern but outvoted fire stations to allow construction of larger facilities on the same parcels is appropriate, conditional upon the, com the Commission's recommendation of approval for the plans for the new building. At the West King Street site, the brick portion of the rear, the rear Grant Street garage appears to have originally been part of an auto sales and service business that operated on the parcel from 1930 to 1959. Removal of the two-story portion of the garage will leave a void along the Grant Street Street escape, although the reconfigured surface parking lot will feature a landscaping screen. And then I note that the East King Street Station already features an open rear parking lot. And this review references standard number one. Then my review on both of the, the new designs is appropriate with conditions. The enlarged buildings designed to meet the functional and programmatic needs of the Fire Bureau are more in character with their, with their respective urban blocks than the existing late 20th century stations. Two-story facades of the new buildings reflect block faces characterized by two and three-story row houses. The facades are visually elongated through inclusion of taller corner towers, which have been pulled forward to meet the sidewalk and buffer the driveway acres. The facades are further articulated through use of garage bay doors with transoms, similar to historic carriage house doors, and areas of glass provided by the balcony level doors and windows. Proposed new designs reflect the function of the buildings while taking into account the character of the surrounding historic neighborhoods and address all categories of the design standards. And then I asked for um, material samples and cut sheets. This review is the standards 9 and 10 and the design standards. It's good to see everybody again. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for some of you for sticking around. Uh, first thing I want to do is I'm going to introduce Chief Little. This is Scott Little, the new Chief, uh, Chief of the Fire Bureau. Y'all haven't met him. Well, we don't really. This would be a nice time to meet you, but other time. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we get started, uh, I just want to ask Chief Little to share a few comments with you all, just to sort of give you the, the sort of the background of why we're doing this. 
and then I'll go into describing some of the conditions of the existing sites where the two buildings are that we're requesting to demolish, and I'm then show you the new construction stuff. Does that sound good to you? Very good. All right. uh, so everybody knows uh, last year uh, the city did um, have a consulting firm come in and do some station locations and, and station design look. Uh, look. That was through a VFIS out at York. Um, so we looked at those and also um, started looking under Mayor Sirachi and the new administration, uh, looking at the current footprints that we have with our three station models uh, throughout the city, uh, current station locations, and also uh, including in that GIS mapping with uh, our response times uh, to meet our industry standards uh, as we protect our citizens. Uh, we uh, came up with uh, looking at all that data together that our King Street stations are appropriate to continue uh, responding from with our on-duty firefighters. So that's why we're here tonight in front of you with these uh, drawings and those two current footprints. We also looked at the uh, the footprints and we tried to design a facility that is uh, 21st century. Uh, and, and we have a lot of issues with the current uh, facilities. Uh, insignificant for today's modern fire apparatus. Uh, today's apparatus, you know, you're talking your length, you're talking 50, 60,000 pound vehicles uh, versus what we had in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, we talk about living space. Uh, we talk about the increase in uh, cancer amongst firefighters in the profession. Uh, and these facilities do not meet any of those uh, standards now in the industry. Uh, now we need to go with, and what these buildings are designed as, is the uh, red, yellow, and green zone. Uh, red zone is where your fire trucks are, your contaminated equipment. Uh, yellow zone is where you get into that medium uh, corridor, and then your green is your living area. Right now, everything is combined all together in our city fire stations. <coughs> so we're trying to do our part to increase the health and safety aspect of our firefighters and give them the conditions uh, of in the living space that, that they deserve as they're protecting our citizens. Thanks, Chief. Um, I'm going to walk through both sites. Uh, I'll put them up on the screen so everybody in the audience can see, and also not knowing that Bob, you're pretty far away from this building. Okay, so, yep. So, first, sites, uh, first site's located at 425 West King Street. And it's approximately where Manor Street intersects with West King. Um, you know, it's geographically located about four blocks west of Penn Square. So uh, uh, typically the station has been servicing the western side of Lancaster City. Um, there, there's an existing building uh, on the site, which is Fire Station 1. Uh, Fire Station 1 was built in uh, 1964, I believe. So it's 55 years old. Uh, Fire Station Three, which is the other one we uh, are going to talk about tonight, was built in 1975, so it's 44 years old. So, again, Fire Station 1 currently sits uh, at 425 West King Street. There's also a uh, block brick um, sort of cobbled together warehouse on the rear of the site, which opens onto Grant Street. Uh, access into that warehouse, there's the garage door on Grant Street, which actually goes down off of Grant Street and collects quite a bit of water off the of Grant Street. <laughs> and um, it was, uh, I don't think we have a, an actual construction date on that, uh, but it was used for car storage at one point in time. Uh, those some, some photographs uh, of the existing building. Uh, it's back again. It's not this one. So there you go. There's the fire station at uh, West King Street. Um, you know, I had the honor of serving on this board for, for 19 years. So I, I um, don't want to presume, but I, I would say that there's a strong argument that this building does not really reinforce a lot of the existing building character on West King Street. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but the biggest reason we're tearing this down, or possibly tearing this down, is actually the construction of the building, the construction of the building is concrete slab, concrete block, um, subgrade utilities, uh, lack of insulation, no insulation, um, uh, environmental systems which, which don't function, and as Chief mentioned, the lack of separation between hazardous and areas that we would like to keep firefighters separate from hazardous materials. So, 
there's a second building. Uh, I'm going to give you a second photograph. Rear elevation of the building off of Grand Street. Um, and, you know, echoes the, the front of the building. There is a, I mentioned a small warehouse on the back, which was used by the city up until last year for the signs and signal shops. And it's where they printed street signs and it's where they repaired traffic lights. So, and now it's just being used for storage. So, so again, questionable architectural heritage. This one, um, a couple of photographs of the, of the block. Uh, the neighborhood uh, being four blocks off of uh, Main Square on a main thoroughfare. Very mixed use uh, commercial and residential functions. Um, and that's the old Gene Shaw's wooden plane right there. Mm -hmm. uh, going across the street, looking down towards the church. You get a combination of two and a half, three story buildings, uh, typically brick, um, um, a, a, a mixed level of detail, some formal uh, eaves, a few simpler eaves, um, and then a little further down on the block, uh, an original fire station, which is now the opera workshop. So, you can see uh, taller on the block. That was the last picture of, of the back of the existing fire station where you can see the warehouse in conjunction. Um, basically, uh, what we're proposing is to demolish everything on the site, to open the site up uh, for the development of a, a new fire station. Um, the apparatus has changed, it's gotten larger, the maneuvering of those apparatus has gotten more difficult. Um, the, the services the fire station or the fire uh, bureau is providing has gotten more extensive, um, and the demand on the bureau has just increased without uh, much investment in that infrastructure. Um, the uh, so I'm losing track here a little bit. So the uh, what you can see is that we have a bigger footprint for the building, uh, and um, we we basically uh, need to use that entire site. I'm going to switch and go to the other demolition real quick and then we'll come back. This is East King Street. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is the sites are almost identical in size. Uh, they're each about 95 feet wide. Uh, West King Street's 97 and a half feet wide. They're each about 225 foot deep. Again, on East King Street, uh, we have a building that was built uh, 1975, and again, four blocks off of, uh, four blocks to the east of, of uh, Penn Square, and uh, at the intersections of, of uh, Howard and Plum, which again provided access to the eastern uh, side of town for the fire department. Uh, again, we have a building that doesn't necessarily reinforce the existing architectural character of the neighborhood. Uh, very similar in style to the other one, even though it was built about nine years difference. Um, again, a, a similar rear elevation where it's just a single story block building. But then we have a, a neighborhood again uh, that's mixed in character, mixed in use, and a combination of, of uh, three story residential commercial structures. Actually, this building here is a church, uh, it's, not a, it's not a residence. Uh, which is immediately adjacent to the fire station, looking the opposite way from the fire station, and then looking across the street from the fire station. So you can see there's a, a theme of scale of two and a half to three story buildings, which is why I'm sharing those photographs with you. Uh, again, on uh, East King Street, we're looking to remove the existing fire station and uh, use a similar footprint to construct a new fire station. Um, the, the concept behind this is that we're doing one project, two sites, two buildings, one project. Uh, we are uh, documenting them um, uh, simultaneously, they'll be bid together, and they'll be constructed consecutively. Uh, part of that is because um, we can't tear both fire stations down at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fire department would like, like us to do that, but we need to have a place to house them. But so the concept would be that uh, we'll be uh, doing the demolition of West King Street uh, and then uh, constructing the station of West King Street 
Once it's complete, there'll be a, a couple week lag time where we'll be testing equipment and testing systems, and then we begin work on East King Street, demolishing the structure and then uh, building the new fire station. General timeline, uh, where it, the goal is to start at uh, the end of summer, uh, which would put the finish date for the first station around March or April of next year. Construction of the second station beginning in May of 2020 uh, and uh, completing it early in 2000, 2021. So, um, let me. So, do you want to do any questions on the demo before we go to new construction or go right to new construction? Do we have any questions from the public on why demolition should be approved? It was in Suzanne's review. Mm -hmm. I just want to avoid case Moyer or Jean comes back to life. <laughs> no, I just wanted to sort of get to speak a little more to that and the difference between the two buildings that we looked at tonight, the previous presentation. I really like to respect the scale and scope of the city to the question and not just, you know, some generic place with high buildings. That Grant Street, there's a lot of warehouses along there. There's a carriage house Can just you, up uh, from the give me your name? Sheldon Weaver. Okay. Uh, city resident. So I just wonder if we could speak to that. How one one certain set of criteria applied in one case, and then another case, you know, a similarly old warehouse, nice fabric along that Grand Street, good pedestrian throughway. And why here there's no questions of why we we done with that. I, I was actually going to ask that, but we haven't gotten to our <laughs> questions or comments yet, so. Uh, uh, I can yep. sort of give a little That's feedback fine. on that. Um, I mean, in our opinion, you know, as obviously the architect for the city, is that neither of these buildings are contributing structures, so obviously not national register structure, structures as well. Uh, neither of them uh, necessarily reinforce the existing uh, well, I was thinking specifically different. about the one in the back. Yeah, yeah. the one in the back uh, in, in itself is quite different than a, some of the warehouses on Grant Street. I mean, the most significant warehouses on Grant Street are much older than this one. I mean, this one is basically uh, a concrete block uh, and brick that's uh, sh sort of um, shed in a way. It's, it's not of the same character of the historic uh, warehouses on Grant Street. It looks like brick in the Google Street. It's brick from starting in Grant and then it becomes block as you move towards the, the uh, fire station. And um, I guess, I think in Suzanne's review, you said it operated as a, a auto sales and service business from 1930 to 1959. Yeah. Which I think that's the this it's brick about portion. The, that's about the age of and the And then, exactly, and then the, in the okay. 1960, the block part got right. put on a very right. sloping right. grade. Right. The, the building itself has taken on quite a bit of water. Um, the existing structure, you know, the existing foundations have cracks and the existing structure, structure is rusted. Um, there is you know, some questions to the bearing capacity. Um, and also, you know, there isn't a, a for this project in particular, there isn't necessarily a function for this building as well. And it does inhibit the development of the site to allow the development of the fire station. These are the same arguments made by the previous building. Mm -hmm. Well, these buildings were not on historical record as historical buildings. These are just buildings that happen to be in the historic district, okay. being built well after the ones that we're trying to protect. So if they're not on that register, they're, they're not no, as valuable. But, yeah. No, no, no. But, but, but yeah. it is different. But it is, it's a, dif it's a difference of quality of the buildings, you know. Um, you know historic value, architectural quality, this is, you know, this is a very utilitarian, just brick and block. No. Um, yeah, it's a brick and block nothing, really. It's, you know, from the, you know, early to mid 20th century. Do you want to go and right. I'm going to keep on and say you want to present the, the new construction? Okay. We'll have other questions and comments. But we're, we're going to we'll let him present and we'll do questions and comments and we'll take go out to the audience. Any other questions about demolition of the fire station? Um, I might have some questions. I, I'd prefer to hear new construction okay. and then to yeah, then follow up questions. That's our usual timing. So again, as I mentioned, these are the developing two stations. Um, they're being built 
consecutively. They're working on the same model. They have a, a similar program. Um, and the predominant feature of that program uh, is going to be the apparatus bay and its position on the site. Um, our goal is to position the, the apparatus bay significantly further back from the street than West King Street, much more similar to East King Street, to allow a anchoring for the uh, emergency vehicles to stage before they pull off onto King Street and then to stage before when they come back off of King Street. Uh, it's, um, uh, the West King. Uh, this is a sort of a sketch of the and I'll take you guys to the end of this as well. What we're trying to do is uh, position the building so that the fire tower, which is uh, this element here, comes forward and reinforces the line of the streetscape of the existing building. Uh, you know, pretty simple concept. The rest of the building, which is the apparatus bay, then would step back and uh, pull back from the, from the street. Um, what you'll see is when the, the, the stair tower, the host tower turns, then we continue the, the streetscape facades and we actually get the entrances and so forth. The combination of the stair tower and the three bays serves to break up the building as similar modulation of existing townhouses on the street, which tends to be from a 16 to 20 foot module uh, based on the D. And um, the cornice lines uh, reinforce the cornice lines of the two story and three story structures, which uh, bind the block. Um, the materials are to reinforce uh, the materials on the block. Um, it's a civic building, not a residential building, uh, so there are some unique things to that, but uh, we're looking at uh, cast stone, uh, brick, um, and some dentitious product at the cupola sort of uh, uh, top of the fire tower. Um, red brick, I'm sure everybody here is this very 52 DD. It's a built brick that we've used a lot. I think we used it on the trust. I think I even used it on King Street. Uh, it's, it's a nice red brick that uh, uh, picks up a lot of the same brick colors and historic structures in Lancaster. It is a full-size brick, not a full set. It yeah. is a full-size brick. Yeah. It's, it's just sample. It's, right? it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, it's available on thin set. It is, but we're not using that. So it has a, a cast stone, uh, uh, the cast stone sills, uh, the cast stone parking uh, on the buildings, the cast stone things. Uh, we're looking at a soldier course for the heads of the windows. Uh, and we'll be looking at red brick with a beige border that reinforces the cast stone. Um, and then a gray tone for the cementitious product, which is uh, located both at the cap of the, stair, of the host stair tower and along the face of this recessed portion above uh, this cornice line, which is a, short, a shallow terrace. Um, uh, one of the things with the layout of the building is, is that the apparatus bay uh, is bigger than the footprint of the old building that we're tearing down. So the apparatus bay itself are three bays of 20 by 100, uh, which uh, is a, you know, takes up a considerable portion of the site. And part of the design that came about from increasing the scale of those apparatus bays, which is to accommodate contemporary equipment, uh, uh, both the pumpers and, and and towers and other emergency vehicles that uh, the fire department has on site is that it limited what we could place on the first floor. Um, but this works in, in, in combination with what Chief uh, Little explained about uh, the red, yellow, green uh, sort of approach to con uh, the design of the building. Those red areas, which are the hazard areas, are the ones that are on the first floor. That's when the firefighters are coming back from the call. Uh, both the trucks on their tires are pulling back in material. Firefighters on their gear are pulling back in material. And you want all that left on the ground floor. And so with a limited footprint, you know, in combination with this design theme, it pushed all the, um, the administrative and living uh, functions up. Uh, but when you have a 25 foot high apparatus bay, it pushes it up to a third floor level, basically. 
and um, and so uh, it's, it's it's and if there's not a there's not a green space, there's not a place that the firefighters would be outside. So we wanted a place for firefighters to step outside. You're there for on you know 24 hour shifts. Uh, if you want to go out for a breath of fresh air, it, it seems reasonable to have a place to go out and not have to go down three stories. Uh, I, I do that. So that's, that's part of that. Also, you know, it allowed the facade to step back, which gave us a break on the streetscape, which helped it reinforce both the two-story buildings and the three-story structures on the side. So we felt fortunate by that. The, um, the, the side here is uh, on the bike on the setback line. Uh, basically, um, traffic on King Street is uh, eastbound. So um, eastbound. So the tower is on the western portion of the site to facilitate the, the turning radius of the apparatus coming out of the base of those call. Um, but the, the building is set five foot off of the um, property line uh, and uh, this side is that flight, but that's not really visible from the street uh, along the property line. And that's this simple pigmented block which works with the cast stone, the same kind of palette. And um, yeah, just to keep on the theme of materials, um, you know, this, the color of the fenestration, color of the garage doors, the, the apparatus bay doors, um, glass sample, which this is a clear glass, uh, which is a solar band. Uh, energy efficient clear glass and uh, that's what we're looking at doing. There is a rail that runs along the second story and that is of the samples of rail. It's just a, it's a metal rail that's done in traditional style. Yeah. Um, that's it. The, the, the nice thing, it's sort of a, oh, over there. The East King Street building um, is as I mentioned, only the side is two foot narrower. Um, the footprint is the same. Uh, the, you know, the battalions that are functioning out of these fire stations do switch. Uh, so the program is intentionally uh, identical so that no matter which station you're working out of, uh, you have when the bell rings at midnight, you know where you're going. Uh, so you're not uh, going from one design of a floor plan to another. Uh, the only difference really is with a two foot narrower site, the, the building is two foot narrower. And all you can see here is this little sliver right there goes from four feet to two feet. So uh, identical elevation, identical materials. firefighters will be drying the hoses after they come back from a, a call. So there's a pulley system at the top of the hose tower that uh, the hoses go up and they're, they're suspended and they're allowed to drain and dry there. That uh, also provides the top access. So, short introduction. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from the commission? I was going to ask, the setback from the street mm -hmm. to the doors of the, of the new firehouses, is that deep enough for the trucks to back in and pull up? Uh, all but maybe fire uh, the, the fire tower, uh, the, the one uh, the ladder truck. Yeah. But uh, we only have so much sight depth, so we tried to maximize it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we sort of took, you know, could we get almost every vehicle? Um, so we're 35 feet uh, from the sidewalk, and the sidewalk's another 10 feet in these cases. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we have about 45 feet to work with, so almost all five vehicles will be able to fit off in that site. And I looked at the pictures that I drove by today, and I was looking at your drawing, and I just couldn't quite yes. get the depth. Right. What's the setback now? Well, King Street is maybe 15 feet. It's, um, it's West King. shallow. West, West King. Yeah, and King, West King Street is fairly shallow. You can sort of see right here. That's the setback right, right. now. And the 
one step back is 35. So you can you can start with the difference in the setback. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And there is you know, basically from sidewalk to Grand Street, there's a certain limitation, obviously. Mm -hmm. 35 feet is what we can lay. I do think, you know, based on, to respond to some of the comments and I had my own thoughts going into this, it's an interesting philosophical kind of place to be in because we have this really unique civic function and this building that has to function in a certain way to serve our community and to, you know, comply with laws and, and everything else. Uh, and yet it, it, you are, you know, requesting demolition, which is not something that we as a commission take lightly. Uh, there may be a hierarchy to how historic historic buildings are, but all buildings that are existing are historic. Uh, you, know, well, you know, just that, that's that, not true. that not temporal uh, yeah, yeah, sort I mean, of relation they, to the present day. Sector of interior standards, I think, establishes 50 years of uh -huh. historic, historic buildings. So, Which arguably, the, the oh. West King Street building right. is historic. <laughs> right. Um, we don't need to knocking things down, you know. Well, I have a general question about, so. so there's two buildings on the West King property, right, that are being requested yeah. for demolition, yeah. and there's just this one existing firehouse on right. East King. That's right. So, so for this, I mean, this question, I guess, is for this commission, does it just take one application to demolish multiple buildings on a single site, or, or is that something where, let's say, there was three other buildings on this site. Um, what, I mean, is that we just consider them all and then reject or uh, approve a demolition of all of them? I just wondered if, I guess, what the criteria was, if each building needed its own? I could, yeah, I could have broken it down. Okay. Yeah, so, so you, okay. you can make just, the motion accordingly if you want to break it down. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, my interest was the one more on Grant Street. I guess what consideration was given to the, um, I guess the, 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 the neighborhood, I know there's nothing on, it's on the side of the street that it's on, but on the other side of the street, I've been up and down there, I'm not, yeah, I don't know if there's homes on, on, on Grand Street.